Hello, I'm Rod Anderson. I'm delighted that you're back with me again as we continue our study. And we're up to study number 23 in this series of 25 called the Orchard Faith of Jesus Study Guides. And you've ordered and did receive 25 of these guides. And uh, now we're up to number 23. Now, if, you're ha if you have accidentally come onto this site and you found, boy, I'd be interested in studying the Bible in this fashion, well, all you have to do is send me an email with your uh, details to info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au. That's info at theorchard.org.au. And uh, I will send those out to you, or my team and I will send those out to you. We need a mailing address so you get the hard copies. And uh, wherever you are in the world, you will receive them absolutely free. Now, as is our habit, we are going to commence with a, a word of prayer as we ask the Lord to bless us now as we study this very important subject about what the Bible teaches about baptism. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that we can open your word wherever the viewer, the listener uh, finds themselves. It may be on public transport, going to work or coming home from work. It may be in a public garden, a public place somewhere. It might be in an office place at lunchtime. It could be in a home, in a group setting, in, a, in an office, anywhere. I ask that that person, wherever you find them in the world, that they would be blessed and encouraged as they've continued this series of studies. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now, uh, as you know, we are studying from the New King James Version Bible uh, with references to the King James Version Bible. And the reason for that is because this, this translation comes directly from the Greek and from the Hebrew, the original manuscripts, and therefore it is an accurate translation. We don't use other translations. And the reason being is because some of those translations have a bias. For example, uh, the Jehovah's Witness Bible is called the New World Translation has a strong anti uh, divinity bias against Jesus there. So they've corrupted the scriptures there, their book there, they call the Bible. Uh, but, and there's a number of other uh, terrible faults with it, the way that they've edited it to suit their um, uh, doctrinal bias. But the King James and the New King James is as accurate as we can get today and it's not connected with any denomination and that's why we use it. Now, because you're watching this on your device, on your computer, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever the case may be, you can press pause at any time. Remember, I've said this a number of times and I'd also ask you to write your answers down in full. Now, it's one thing to read the question and then I give an explanation from the verse as we turn to the Bible verses. But it's a very different thing entirely for you to be able to write it down in your own words. And that's going to help you in the future if you ever need to explain the reasons of your faith. So if you can reduce your thoughts down to writing and writing in it, write it in a coherent and clear fashion, that means when you come to review these at a later time, and I hope you do, in fact, I hope you go over these 25 studies a number of times over the years just to sharpen your um, uh, knowledge up or just to reawaken some thoughts that may have been forgotten, that you already have the answers, Dan, and it will help you immensely, particularly if you want to share these study guides with other people that you come in contact with. All right, well, let's begin now. Number 23, what the Bible teaches about baptism. And it asks, what is the biblical method of baptism? Well, let's go to our first text <coughs> found in the New Testament. We're in Matthew chapter 3 and we're looking at verses 13 to 16. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 13 to 16. <coughs> and this is, <coughs> excuse me, and this is talking about the baptism of Jesus here. And it says, then Jesus came from Galilee to John, this is John the Baptist, at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then <coughs> he allowed him. Now let's pause here. God, sorry about this, God. Um, what we see here is that, uh, that uh, Jesus has come to John. 
And John says, no, 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 I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, he says here, uh, he says, uh, let us fulfill all righteousness because he knew that it was the Father's will, the Heavenly Father's will, that he himself be baptized. Then, in verse 16, it says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and beheld the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like, <coughs> excuse me, like a dove and alighting upon him. So the Bible tells us that Jesus went down under the water. He comes up out of the water. The Bible then says that um, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. And then in verse 17, we read this. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well Please. So this passage that we read here identifies Jesus going down under the water and then coming up out of the water. It says when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. In the book of Acts, we realize that that was the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that the Holy Spirit wasn't with Jesus from the beginning of his birth. And we know that that was certainly the case. But But this new phase of Jesus' ministry, Jesus received the anointing in order to equip him to continue on with this different phase of ministry now. Uh, And also the other thing we hear is the affirmation by God the Father from heaven. He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So we know we, we see the Holy Spirit there, we see God the Son there, and we also see God the Father there as well at the baptism of Jesus. So we have God the Father, Jesus who was baptised and the Holy Spirit. Now the word used here for baptise is baptismo and it simply means to dip or immerse, to go down under the water, be submerged. That's what it actually means. So what is the biblical method of baptism? Well, the Bible talks about baptism by immersion. Jesus was baptised. Now, The other thing was, um, Jesus was an adult. He wasn't a baby either. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Let's turn now to our next text, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. So we have 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we have Galatians, and then Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 in our Bibles. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And the words are very clear. Here by Paul, for he says this. He says, one Lord, one faith, and how many baptisms? What does your Bible say? One baptism. So there is only one biblical method of baptism. There's not a myriad. There's not a multitude of different types of baptism that have the approval of God. There's one type, and we've already discovered it's by immersion. Let's read on now. Question number two, who commanded that we should be baptised? In other words, is this a man-made ordinance or not? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 28. In our Bibles, Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 to 20. And here it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Now here in verse 19, we read that Jesus says, go and make disciples. Now, a disciple is not simply a follower. It's a It's a fallacious teaching that identifies disciples as somebody who is just a student, somebody who's learned from a teacher. A disciple, when we fully understand the word disciple, it's someone who reflects the teachings and the attitude of the teacher. So when it says to make disciples, Jesus says, go out and make disciples. What what he is actually instructing the disciples to do is to go out Teach and instruct them in his ways, not only the way that he spoke personally to the disciples, but through all the teachers and the prophets in the Old Testament. Teach and instruct them fully 
so that they have a full doctrinal understanding of what his requirements are of them and then it says baptise them. In other words, once people understand, then we have this ordinance of baptism. But who was it who gave the ordinance of baptism? It was Jesus Christ himself. Let's go to question number three now. How much water is needed for baptism? Well, let's go to John, John chapter 3 and verse 23 now. John 3 and verse 23 and we read this. John 3 and verse 23 it says, now John, this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was what? There was much water there. So the first thing that we understand is for a person to be baptized, you need a lot of water. You can't have a handful of water because a person can't fall, uh, uh, be immersed in a handful of water. You can't have a laver of water because a, 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 a person cannot be baptised. An adult cannot be baptised in a laver of water. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 now. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Then we have Acts. Acts chapter 8 verses 35 to 39. And this is the... Uh, the episode with Philip where he, uh, he is guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then tells him to go over to the chariot where the eunuch, the treasurer from Ethiopia is riding and he's reading from the book of Isaiah but we're going to start from verse 35 now. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. This is the Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to, came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptised? Or the Greek word there is baptismo, to be immersed. Verse 37, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In other words, he is testifying with his tongue that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And then he says in verse 38, so he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptised him. So it says that Philip and the eunuch went down into the the water, the word there is like submerge. It's, uh, so beg your pardon, baptismo is submerge. It's to immerse beneath. So again, there's water there. There's water enough. There wasn't just a little thimble of water to pour upon his head. Philip didn't do the sign of the cross on the forehead of the child, not uh, of the eunuch. No, no, as we see in churches today. It's not like that at all. In fact, the Bible says that he went down under the water Therefore, he must come up out of the water. Question number four. When a, person's, when a person is baptised, what is washed away? So we're going to the book of Titus now. Now, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Then we have Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Timothy. And then straight after Timothy... Second Timothy, we have a small book called the book of Titus. This again is one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 now. And we read, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's pause here. The question is asking, when a person is baptised, what is washed away? Well, let's read it again. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, so we're not saved by our own works, that's important to understand, but through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit from previous studies that we've done? Well, it's to point out sins in our lives. The Holy Spirit prompts our conscience, convicts our conscience, and as we, as we, as we um, turn away from those sins, as we respond to the invitation of grace, as we look to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, as we study the Scripture, we see uh, there's, there is harmony between the inner moral law, our conscience, which the Holy Spirit communicates to each individual of and within, and there's also... Um, 
consistency with the promptings of the Holy Spirit and also the Word of God. So the purpose of this regeneration that we read about here is to wash away our sins in order that we walk in harmony with God and we avail ourselves of the grace which is given us of God. Let's continue on because there's another passage here and it's found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. So we flick over a few pages and we come to Hebrews. Then we find James. We're going to 1 Peter now, which follows James. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And we read this. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Therefore, so there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here, Peter likens baptism to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he says here uh, that baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. So baptism doesn't physically wash away the dirt and therefore we're clean in that sense. No, no, no. He's saying, but it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. As we respond to the light that God has given us and we ask as Father, in everything that you've done for us and what Jesus has done for us, how can I show my appreciation to you? Well, Jesus himself said in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, verse 10, Jesus says, uh, keep my commandments just as I've kept my Father's commandments. So the Father's commandments are the Ten Commandments. The commandments that Jesus kept were the Ten Commandments. This is what he is asking us to keep. But there's also something else here. When we are baptised, it's a public demonstration of our faith in Jesus Christ. And he has asked us to be baptised. So we go down under the water and then we come up in this regeneration of a new life in a commemorative act of what Jesus did when he died and then came forth from the tomb. Now, Peter hints at this. We're going to read this uh, in more detail in the writings of Paul in the book of Romans shortly. But when a person is baptised, what is washed away? Their sins symbolically are washed away as we by faith go forward with Jesus Christ. All right, question number five. How were the consequences of our sins moved, removed from us? Uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, that open book that people can understand. It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, we learn more of the gospel of Christ. We learn more of what Jesus is doing for us. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we also read these very, very pertinent words to our study. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. The question is asking, how were the consequences of our sins removed from us? It was through Jesus' death on the cross, but also as he came forth from the tomb in the resurrected life. So we have the twin um, teachings of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but also the resurrection, because without any resurrection, there would be no, no um, profit at all in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You needed both of them. The world, the, the universe needed both of them. Not only the death on the cross, but also the resurrection. And the Bible says that Jesus is the first fruits. That is, he is the first fruits. He is the promise of the resurrection to come. Let's continue on now. Question number six. What marvellous blessing of baptism? That's our subtitle. What marvellous blessing of baptism? In whose name are we baptised? Well, let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. And we're looking at verse 19 here. Matthew 28. Remember, press pause if you don't have enough time to write your answers in. Uh, and then press play again on your device, or if you don't have enough time to look at the verses, just press pause and you'll catch up with, uh, with me in no time at all. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 we're reading from. And here, Jesus instructs his disciples in this fashion. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of who? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when a person's baptized, they're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So when I'm baptizing adults, when I'm baptizing people who have reached the age of accountability where they know what sin is, when they know who God is, when they know who Jesus Christ is, they understand what it means to be a Christian in every sense of the word. When I'm standing there in the font within the church or persons may request to be baptised in a lake or by the sea. I've even baptised people in rivers and in creeks. Uh, I will say uh, words to the effect that now it's your desire to follow the example of Jesus Christ. I now happily and gladly baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why do I do that? Because this is the counsel which Jesus has given us and uh, me in this, uh, this, uh, this rite of baptism. Turning the page now to question number seven. What does baptism memorialize? Let's go to Romans now. Romans chapter six. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans. Romans chapter six and we're looking at verses four to six. And here the Apostle Paul says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised... Sorry. Therefore, we were buried with him, that's Jesus, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, so in other words, when a person is standing in the water, they go down under the water, it's symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, knowing this... Uh, for if we have been united, in verse 5, together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So as a person comes forth from the waters, from beneath the waters, they actually are symbolically representing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that is the old life, the old sinful ways were crucified with him, that with the body of sin we might be, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. This is the verse 7 there. This is the crux of the entire matter. When a person is baptised, they go down under the water. It symbolises the death to the old life. The sins are washed away. And as they come forth, it represents a commencement of a new life in Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus died on the cross and he came forth from the tomb. Now, from this passage that we've read from the Apostle Paul and from Peter, we realise that baptism is the memorial to Christ's death and resurrection. But remember this, there are people who teach in many denominations, in many of the largest churches in the land, that Sunday keeping is uh, something that we practice in honour of the resurrection. Now, point one is that's not found in the Bible anywhere. You cannot support that with a single scripture. But point two is, if we really want to know what the memorial to Christ's resurrection is, it's not Sunday keeping, it's actually baptism by immersion. So when a person goes down under the water and comes up, it represents Christ's death and resurrection. And it's just as simple and as plain as that. You don't have to do any mental gymnastics to make this, th this fit. The Bible is very clear. And you notice that there's harmony between the writers of the Bible as well because the author is God. And it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit that brings harmony to the writings that we find within the Scripture. Now remember this, the amazing thing about the Bible, it was written over 1,500 years. It was written on three different continents. We also see that there were people of different educational standards and different views. And you have tent makers, you have shepherds, you have priests, you have kings, you have all sorts of people involved in the um, writing 
readings of the different books of the Bible, but on each and every occasion, there is absolute harmony. And this is, if any, any, if there's any one great proof which proves the inspiration besides uh, the amazing prophecies is the, um, the harmony that we find within the Bible itself from the various writers. Let's continue now. Question number eight. What divine institution do you join when baptized? So what divine institution, question eight, do you join when baptized? Press pause if you need to write answer your answer in or uh, look up a text. But now we're going to Acts chapter 2 and verses 41 and 42. So Acts chapter 2 and 41 and 42. We might even read um, a verse 44 here, but uh, let's continue on. Okay, Acts chapter 2 and verse um, 41 and 42. Then those who gladly receive his word, that's Peter's word at the time of, of uh, the Pentecost sermon. This is 10 days after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Verse 41, 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. Now, what's a soul in the Bible? Well, I'm a soul. You're a soul. It's everything we are. It's the sum total that makes us individuals. Uh, it's the flesh. It's our awareness. It's our consciousness. It's our sense of time and space. It's all those things that make us a soul. It's the sum total of a man and a woman, as we've said in pre previous presentations. So the question is asking here, what divine institution do you join when baptised? Well, from this verse here, we see that it is the church, God's church. That's what we join when we are baptised. All right. Some people have this idea, I would love just to be baptised, but I don't want to join a church. You can't do it. No pastor, no minister, no priest, nobody can do that because the, the biblical example we see here is that when a person is baptised, they join the church and it's as simple and as plain as that. And if a person doesn't want to join, the, join a church, this is what I'd say to any pastor who's tempted to baptise that person, don't do it. Do not do it. Don't do it until they have reached a point of maturity in their walk with Christ that they're, they're prepared to join the church. All right, let's carry on. Question number nine. What promise is made to those who repent and are baptised? Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we read this now. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. Now remember when Jesus was baptised, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. It was an extra measure of the Holy Spirit to, to equip him, prepare him for the next phase of his ministry for the salvation of mankind. When a person is baptised, they receive an extra measure of the Holy Spirit to assist them in their maturing walk with Christ. And it's just as simple as that. Now, there's another verse here. Write the answer down. Press pause if you need time. But there's another verse here, another two verses, and it's found in Acts chapter 10, and we're looking at verses 47 and 48. Acts chapter 10 and verses 47 and 48. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water? Now he's talking about these people being baptised. That these should not be baptised, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptised in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now why did I read that passage? Because the truth is nothing to fear from investigation. You see, Peter says here, can anyone forbid these people from being baptised? That is, these are non-Jews, these are Gentiles. And this is the first time that we have in the Bible where a Jew, sorry, where a non-Jew is baptised into the Christian church. But the point that I'm highlighting here is that, uh, that these people have already received the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this is consistent with what we read a little earlier as well, because the Holy Spirit convicts us and leads us and guides us, informs us of what is right and what is true, what is false and what is error. And as we go forward in our walk with Christ, what we understand is that we are convicted of more truth and as we come to a point in our Christian walk of a level of maturity, it's our desire then that we be baptised. And that's well and good. But if it wasn't for the promptings and the leading of the Holy Spirit, no one would come to that point of decision. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit highlights to us in our infancy and in our walk with Christ when we're beginning to respond to what we know is right, to that inner moral, moral law which gives us an awareness of who God is. In the promptings and leadings of the Holy Spirit there, we are responding to God through the Holy Spirit. But when we're baptised, we are given an extra measure. There's a... There's a a willingness of the Holy Spirit to continue the work of maturity in the walk with Christ. And this is all that Peter is saying here. Yes, these people have received the Holy Spirit, it's evident. They want to be baptised. Why should we forbid them? Why should we stop them? Let them be baptised so they can join the church and continue their Christian walk, even though they're not Jews, even though they're not Jews but they are non-Jews, they are Gentiles. And all was well. Those men, uh, Cornelius and his household, were certainly baptised. Let's continue on now. What is baptism the fruit of? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. We have Acts and Romans. We have Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We have Galatians, Ephesians, and then we come to Philippians. And then Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. As we answer question number 10... What is baptism the fruit of? Chapter 3, verse 1 says this. If you then were raised with Christ, that is baptism, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Paul here to the church at Colossae says, okay, you've been baptised, but that's not where your journey ends. He says, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. See, the Christian walk is a continual work of progression. Once a person is baptised, it's not the end. In fact, I know that you're thinking that in doing all these studies, these 25 studies, when we conclude these studies, that you've learned a lot, and you have. There's a lot of information that you have learnt, and if you go back over and review these 25 studies, you are going to be astounded at what you have already started to forget because there is such an immense amount of, of material that we find in God's inspired word that he wants us to know. However, this is only the beginning of the journey and my experience is this, that as I've continued to um, actively participate in the Christian church, I have found that day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, I have continued to learn and that is happening today, in my life today. So baptism is only the beginning of the journey and that's what the Apostle Paul is referring to here in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Yes, it's the evidence that the Holy Spirit has worked on us and we are responding to the invitation of Jesus Christ for salvation, that's certainly the case. But it's the beginning, it's not the end, it's not the conclusion. Let's go to, um, to uh, John, John chapter 3, the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5 now. John chapter 3 and verse, verses 3 to 5 and we read this. Jesus answered and said to him, and he's speaking to Nicodemus here. This is the secret meeting that Nicodemus arranged with Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, how interesting that Jesus talks about the new birth experience as, as being born again. Now, we know that when a woman brings forth a child into this world, there is the breaking of the water. Isn't that the case? But prior to the breaking of the, the, the water, in order for that child to be fit, in order for that 
child in every sense of the word to be equipped to breathe oxygen, to be able to survive in the world in which we fight, they, they come into, there is a whole lot of development that ha happens from the em embryonic stage. The same applies for us. When a person is responding to the Holy Spirit in the em embryonic stage of their Christian walk, they develop, they grow, they mature, they learn, they observe, they start coming to church, they're witnessing things, uh, and as they just come to the point where they're ready for the, uh, the full birthing, they break forth out of the waters of baptism. Now, Jesus calls that the new birth because it's the fruit of the new birth experience that's already been happening. When a person is baptized, it's the evidence that the Holy Spirit has been working on that person and they have been born again. The things that they once loved, they now hate. The things that they will love, though they once desired, now they no longer desire those things. Other priorities have come into their lives because they have been born again in the spiritual sense. But let's keep reading. So in chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, uh, Jesus says here, He said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can, when he's old? can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, what Nicodemus is, here, is doing here is exactly what opponents of the Bible do. Those people who claim to be atheists, these people who claim to be Darwinists, Darwinists in their uh, ideology, what they do, they know what a an advocate for the Bible or for Christianity is saying, but what they do is they reduce it to something silly. They, they reduce it to something trivial to, to underscore, to offset the, uh, the faithful, so to speak. And this is what Nicodemus is doing here. He says, so well, how can I as an adult be born again? But notice what, what Jesus said. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I want you to notice verse 9, though. It's not in the study, but I'm going to look at it anyway. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Notice what Jesus says to him in verse 10. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Jesus is saying, are you joking? I know you're not joking. I know you're having a lend of me here. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, you're a man of great integrity. You're a man who's supposed to have a very high mental faculty, the ability to be able to teach and instruct others. And you're asking me, teach a questions that a child would answer and would know the answers to? Come on. Nicodemus, are you really serious? But let's go to verse 5, back to verse 5 now. Jesus answered, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water, that is baptism by immersion, and one of the Spirit, because a person cannot uh, be baptised with the right motives unless the Holy Spirit has already commenced its work. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So, what is uh, baptism the fruit of? It's the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Explain the method of baptism and its importance. So in your own words now, we've come to this summary section here. In your own words, explain the method of baptism and its importance. Now we go to the reflection question. What evidence shows that you are ready for baptism? Well, I can only say what my experience is. I can't talk for you. But I realized as I had been studying the Bible for quite some time, and I was convinced that there were certain truths that could not be challenged, that could not be other... Um, could not be um, debated. And that was things like the Ten Commandments are still important today. Uh, the Sabbath is still something that God wants us to keep today, to remember today. Uh, that when a person dies, they sleep, they remain in the grave until the second coming of Christ. That we don't go to heaven at death as I was, as I was taught as a Presbyterian. That we don't go into the grave, uh, sorry, that we don't go to hell and to be tortured for eternity as I was taught as a Presbyterian. There are certain truths that were not consistent with the Bible. As a Presbyterian, I was taught predestination, that Calvinistic teaching, which 
which also was washed over into the, uh, many Baptist um, uh, uh, tenets of faith as well and this simple idea that before the creation of this world God already chose who was going to be lost and who was going to be saved however that is at odds with what we learn in John chapter 3 verse 16 where Jesus says for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life you see the gospel is all about free choice it's not about God predetermining who's going to be lost and who's going to be saved. In fact, when we go to some of those passages that Calvinists use, uh, they talk about the elect of God, these sort of things. They say, there you go, that's simply prove it. No, 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 it's not saying that at all. All it's saying is that God knew prior to the creation of this world who would make the choices they would for salvation and, and against salvation as they respond to the gospel invitation. And it's just as simple as that. So, what evidence shows that you were ready for baptism? In my case, I was, I was intellectually clear in my mind that the Bible, uh, the Bible teachings, of the Bible teachings, I should say, but I also recognised in my heart of hearts that this was an appointment with God that I couldn't put off. There was no way. This was the most important thing that I had to do in my life. That's where it was for me. Baptism was the most important event in my life and therefore I had to go through the ordinance of baptism. So that's how I knew for me. But for you it may be a little bit different. But I would say for all truly born again men and women, if baptism is not the most important thing in your life, the next great appointment that you have to keep, then perhaps you're not quite ready for baptism. Let's move on now. Question number two. Why isn't baptism the end of the spiritual journey? Well, this reflection question we've already answered prior to, to, to that. So press pause as you write your answer. I'm going to move straight on to the resolution section which says, I believe in baptism by immersion. I want to be baptised following in the steps of my Lord Jesus Christ. So if that's you, if that's what you want to do, write your name and then sign beneath it. Now we're going to the additional study section on page three. And it begins with this. <coughs> Excuse me. What is baptism? The word baptism comes from a Greek word baptism, which baptismo, which means to dip or immerse. A person is buried beneath the water of baptism and is also raised out of the water. Baptism is the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection. It is also the outward evidence of the inward transformation that has occurred through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Forms of baptism. According to the, the, word, the meaning of the word and following the examples set forth by Jesus and the apostles, baptism must be by immersion, meaning a person must be entirely covered with water. Excuse me. Matthew testifies that Jesus rose from the water. When John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon, it was because there was much water there. Philip and the Ethiopian both went down into the water. Only one biblical method of baptism. There is only one true baptism. Cardinal James Gibbons, who lived from 1834 to 1921, said, For some centuries after the establishment of Christianity, the baptism was ordinarily conferred by immersion. But since the 12th century, the Catholic Church commenced the practice of pouring, a uh, practice of baptism by infusion, which is pouring. Other denominations and groups practice triune baptism, sprinkling, infant baptism, dipping, etc. However, none of these latter methods of baptism are biblical. Who can be baptised? The Bible lays down certain conditions that must be met before a person can be baptised. For example, there must be a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and acceptance of him as saviour. There must be a repenting or a turning away from sin, followed by a confession of sins. A person must know and understand the teachings of the Bible. A person must practice the doctrines, the teachings of the Bible that they have learnt. It is not enough to know what the Bible says. A person must live in accordance with its commands and its examples. Infant baptism is not biblical. Under these biblical conditions, 
sorry, under these conditions, it is clear that a baby cannot be baptised, though an infant can be dedicated to God in a beautiful dedication service, as Jesus was recorded in Luke chapter 2, a person must have a clear understanding of the biblical requirements as Jesus did when he was baptised. They must be able to think independently and intelligently. There is no biblical support for infant baptism in the Bible. Rebaptism. A person can be baptised a second time if they have strayed from the truth and then made a conscious decision to return. A person may also be rebaptised if their knowledge of scripture or do- scriptural doctrines has, in- has greatly increased and has caused them to change their worship practices and understanding of salvation through Jesus Christ. Baptism is evidence that the Holy Spirit has captured the heart. Baptism is one of the fruits of a born-again life in Christ as we follow his example. It becomes a public, uh, sorry, it becomes a public testimony of our renunciation of a sinful past and the birth to new life in Christ. There is a promise of forgiveness for past sins and a generous measure of the Holy Spirit given to guide us as we go forward in Christ. In addition, the baptised person comes into closer relationship with Christ and becomes members of Christ's church on earth and join the family of heaven. After the baptism, as a result of the old life having been lived beneath Uh, having been buried beneath the waters of baptism. From the moment a person rises from the water, they begin a brand new life in Christ. Thereafter, the way of life is entirely different. We submit and are guided by by the Spirit as we imitate Jesus Christ in our lives. There is a turning away from sin. A baptized person will still need to be aware of evil, but God will guard them and strengthen them. Sanctification is defined as being set aside for holy work. Our goal as baptised Christians is to become men and women who are drawing strength from God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and are being changed into Christ's likeness moment by moment, day by day. How important is baptism? It is your personal identification with the greatest act of human history, the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. The Apostle Paul said, For by grace you have been grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by the grace of God. It was Christ's death on the cross that brings us pardon from the death penalty as we submit our lives to him. The merits of Christ's sacrificial act are accredited to us. Your guilt before God is removed the moment you trust in Christ. Baptism is your personal testimony to and belief in Jesus Christ as your Saviour. What then does baptism mean? One, it means we have turned from the old life of sin to a new life in Jesus Christ. It means we are publicly identifying with the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. And three, it means we are openly joining the ranks of those who believe in Christ. When you are baptised, you are in fact visually preaching the gospel. As you stand in the water waiting to be baptised, A, you symbolise Jesus dying on the cross. B, as you are lowered into the water, you symbolise Jesus as he was buried in the tomb. And C, as you are raised from the water, you symbolise Jesus rising from the dead. The memorial of Christ's burial and resurrection. Many churches teach Sunday is the memorial of Christ's resurrection and for that reason they call it the Lord's Day. However, the Bible teaches us that baptism by immersion is a memorial to Christ's death and resurrection. Furthermore, Jesus himself recognised that the sa- recognized the Saturday Sabbath as his day, thus identifying the Sabbath as the Lord's Day. It was Pope Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, from 313 to 335 AD, who officially authorised the title, the Lord's Day, to be associated with Sunday. Nevertheless, the Bible is very clear that baptism by immersion is the memorial to Christ's death and resurrection, and by those two events, salvation became available to us. Amen. 
Well, there we go. Finish study number 23 on this very important topic of baptism. Now, if you are wanting to get baptised and you desire to be baptised, please don't hesitate to contact us wherever you are throughout the world. And what I will do, I will direct you to a, a church pastor whose teachings are consistent with the Bible and I will direct you to that, that, that pastor, to that church and then you can um, uh, go through this beautiful ordinance or experience the beautiful ordinance known as baptism. Well, I want to congratulate you on your good work. We've only got two more studies to do now and uh, I know that you're enjoying these because you've continued to do them. Remember this though, we're trying to... Um, get a good understanding of what the Bible says on 25 vital topics, but there is still more to learn from the Bible. And I'll be sharing a little bit more of that information with you in a future presentation. However, uh, our custom is, as we conclude our time together, is to finish in prayer. So I know that you may be on a train, you might be on public transport somewhere in a public park, but if you can just in a very uh, quiet and subtle way close your eyes and bow your heads as I seek the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we want to acknowledge your love and care for us. We thank you for this beautiful rite of back baptism and I pray that those people, uh, that individual who's listening to me now or that individual who is watching this telecast or watching it on the internet that they would respond to you and as they do that their hearts would rejoice and be glad that they've chosen to make you the better part of their life Father. So we praise your name, we thank you for Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour and it's in his dear name that we pray, Amen. It's been lovely to be with you again. Remember this, the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. But before I say goodbye, I want to let you know about our second last study, the penulp penultimate study, study number 24. And the topic is what the Bible teaches about the Christian way of life. So when we are baptised, as we are responding to the invitation of grace and the Holy Spirit, in what way should we live? What should we do? What sort of peoples ought we to be in holy conversation and godliness, to quote the Apostle Peter? I'm Rod Anderson. We're going to find out about that next time. Uh, goodbye for now.